There we go. So, yes, that actually ties into one of my analysis. First of all, welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving week or fall break or whatever we call it these days. Uh, let's move over to announcements first. Yes, that game was very stressful, wasn't it? All right. Uh, number one, course evaluations are out. It's that time of year again. I strongly encourage you to fill them out. Normally, I give like extra credit if the class, if I get a certain percentage of people doing it. And I'm willing to do that. And some, I'll give you some unannounced version of extra credit if everybody, all 100% completion, OK? I can't see who completed it, but I can tell one person has so far. To whomever that was, thank you. I do want to hear your feedback. I do appreciate it. And as you know, in my household, there's a little bit of a competitive rivalry. I'm competitive about too many things. So help me beat Lisa <laughs> for how, no, I don't want any funny business. I can be like, well, reply to my survey, and if you're in her class, don't reply to hers. No, no, reply to both. But let's, let's just see. Help me have household bragging rights in the, on the mean streets of Coralville about this, OK? So, but actually, do be honest. Do tell me what, what worked, what didn't work. Even though this is the second time I'm teaching this class, honestly, this is like a brand new prep. As you know, I'm struggling to get slides up each week. I'm struggling to get everything done. I haven't had to cancel class because of that yet, but please do consider filling out your survey. You can even do so right now if you brought a device. Anyway, also for those of you online. Um, second, after multiple attempts, I finally got the link right. There's an announcement on ICON about a sign-up sheet for presentations. Remember, the presentations are optional. It's December 14th. It's a Wednesday of finals week going from 12 to 3. You're not graded on the presentation. I'm encouraging you to do so because I'd like for you to show your model and your stand code to other f folks in the room because I think that the more that you share what you've learned, the more people will get a better sense of it as well. Uh, I know there's a lot of stand code. There's a lot of topics in this class. I totally understand it. But sort of immersion in it is one way of thinking it through. And the other part of it is just each person can just take a mental note of what your code was. And if they're ever in a spot where you, they might need to do a similar model, they can you know, send you an email and ask, ask you for the code. So that's the way I look at it. OK? Finally, uh, actually, important note on that, I promised you pizza. So I'm going to have pizza that day. So if you have a request for a type of pizza, either toppings or where it's from. I know one of you mentioned a special place for pizza that you liked, and I don't know which one that was. Um, I'm not getting it from the gas station. I'm sorry. <laughs> Is anybody going to be disappointed? Because actually, if you really want a gas station pizza, I probably would do it. Just sort of, you know, anyway. OK, but if you have a request for food or pizza, let me know. We're going to have it. Once again, this project presentation will be uh, room 210A, South Linquist, which is downstairs, right next door to my office in the CASMA conference area, you know, that glass enclosed glass area on the second floor of the South Linquist Center. So, all right, here are the plans for lectures for the end of the semester. First, today we're talking about multidimensional models, which is not exactly trivial. Um, second, Friday, we'll talk missing data, and if time permits, We'll talk about empirical priors. Missing data is a lot easier than multidimensional models. Still not entirely trivial. Um, empirical priors, pretty, pretty quick to do. Um, next Monday, we'll talk about scale identification methods. That actually links to empirical priors. Because it turns out, if you think of estimating like the latent variable's variance, Oftentimes, in a non-Bayesian sense, you have to set a, a loading or a discrimination parameter to one to do, to do that. Well, you're estimating a hyperparameter, which technically makes that an empirical prior. But we have identification issues if we start to have too many empirical priors. So we're going to talk about that next week. And then the last class will be model fit with PPMC and WAIC, or leave one out. But I will note. If the United States wins Saturday, their next game is at 1 p.m. next Friday. It's a big if, right? Anybody want to put their hands up? How many of you think that USA will win Saturday? Anybody? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah? No. Oh. Oh, oh, but if they do, then that last lecture will be on YouTube, and I will be watching the game. Oh, excuse me. I will be using a sick day. <laughs> I feel a cold coming on next Friday. I might catch it on Saturday, okay? So, sound good? Okay. Now, I know that many of you know, are, are following the World Cup, and at 1 o'clock we have some games on. Anybody interested in those results? Okay, so if any of you are following along on your computer while I'm lecturing, if there's a goal in any of those games, I need you to interrupt. Just, <laughs> okay? I've been told by Ariel, who is off premises because he is from Argentina, who's playing at one, that he will text me if, our, if Argentina scores, so I may get interrupted. But we'll find out. Okay. It's weird having the World Cup in wintertime. Is the cadence of the fall semester, usually this time of year, eh, whatever sports, whatever, I'm not that into it, but this, like I love the World Cup, so it's, it's fun to, I don't think a lot of you do too, it's fun to sort of talk about it. Normally it's summer, so I don't have to worry about it competing with class, so this is a new experience for all of us. All right, anyway, should we get on to multidimensional models? Do you have anything you wanna ask me before I begin? Anybody online? The Wedge, best pizza in Iowa City. Yes, I will do that. Uh-oh, and I will check, I, I noticed a comment, you can only open the read-only version of the presentation. I will check to make sure it's uh, open for everybody when I get done with class, so sorry. Comment online said Wedge Pizza, and uh, the presentation signups are not fully open yet, so I'll get them, sorry. Evidently, my brain is still on break. Yes, actually, it's still on break. All right, multidimensional latent variables. By the way, all of this class could be thought of as a prerequisite for the class I teach next fall, which is on multidimensional models. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into multidimensional models. So this is just how to code very basic multidimensional models in STAN. But I actually prefer using Bayesian methods to estimate multidimensional models because of the complexities of how we have to marginalize latent variables to make it work. So next fall, I'll be teaching that class. Thank you to those of you who voted on the EMS Discord for that one. Um, we'll go from there. So we're just gonna talk about how to estimate multidimensional latent variable models. We use our same data that we're used to. I'll just skip through that. Let's talk about those latent variables though. All right. So once again, this is a slide from the last time I talked, I sort of gave you the generalized latent variable framework. Up until multidimensional, we said, okay, on the, remember there's the two sides, so the right-hand side and the left-hand side, right? The left-hand side of the model is where your data goes, the right-hand side is where I call the theory goes, right? Up to this point, we've had the theory say there's only one trait underlying these assessment items, or this, this quiz, this uh, conspiracy data that's online. But then we went and changed the data like the different distributions for data. So now we're back on the right-hand side and saying, well, what if, what if really we had more than one dimension? Remember that thing I made you try in here, the alignment where we try to figure out which items might measure which factors and so forth? Not usually the thing we wanna do, we wanna have a good sense of what the dimensions are ahead of time and before we write the questions that people will answer. But now we're gonna talk about those latent variables. Um, so, <coughs> We are specifying them. We have to talk about what their distribution is. Everything's normal in this class, more normally distributed. When we have two latent variables, like we're gonna have in just a moment, two or more, we usually call that a multivariate normal distribution. The neat thing about the code I'm gonna show you though, is it actually works for single latent variable models too, because one variable, if you say it follow, you know, sorry, a multivariate normal distribution in one dimension is just a univariate normal. That's basically how it works, right? So that's that. Um, we specify, we have to do, still specify the mean standard deviation itself. Now, um, that's sort of the technical side of the latent variables, but more importantly, where these dimensions come from is best done by definition, right? So you start off by saying, I'm measuring, let's say, two different dimensions. Uh, belief in governmental conspiracy theories, like the government is the actor in this, or belief in non-governmental, like there's some 
you know, rogue set of people who are causing issues. That's what I, when we looked at this conspiracy data before. And um, that linking of each item to each dimension is sometimes called alignment and educational measurement, a factor pattern matrix and factor analysis, a Q matrix is what I will call it, because that's the field I come from, diagnostic models calls it Q matrix, but it works the same way, okay? It literally is, when you write an item, you're trying to denote which traits it's measuring. And you'll note, if you took factor analysis, or you've had a history of factor analysis, maybe not from the way that either I teach or Elise teaches it, a lot of life in psychometrics starts with exploratory factor analysis, trying to determine what the pattern of factors are. We don't like that, right? From a philosophical point of view, when you're writing a questionnaire, you are controlling what you're writing, and if you have to go explore the data to figure out what it measures, you sort of don't understand what you're writing questions to. All right, so the chicken or the egg, right? The way I like to think of it is, you come up with the idea of what you're measuring. What is the latent trait first? And then you write questions aligned to it. Or if you have more than one latent trait, you do that. Not the other way around, which is what exploratory factor analysis says. Give me your data, and I'll try to help you figure out the traits. Exploratory factor analysis has a, a few problems. Uh, stable estimates, understanding what things mean, uh, generalizability. All of that causes, like, there's, a, there's some technical issues I don't prefer with it, especially if you get into maximum likelihood. But from a philosophical point of view, we're building multidimensional models where we understand the dimensions themselves and we're writing items for it. Now, it may not be the case that those dimensions are present, but it's a lot easier to understand that when you fit a multidimensional model and then reduce it than the other way around. Okay? Okay. So you remember the Q matrix before? We had built a Q matrix. This was many weeks ago. I think it was October-ish. I, I felt so much younger back then. I've aged considerably since then. Uh, maybe that soccer game on yesterday was, was too much for me. I don't know. But um, here, basically, we talk about um, the alignment of, of specifying which items measure which dimension, which latent variables. I'm using, by the way, the term dimension and latent variable synonymously here, okay? Multidimensional models means multiple latent variable models, I should say that. In the old days, we used to say items load onto factors. I don't like that term. I think it's, like, what is a load anyway? It seems like there's some electrical engineering going on that I'm not familiar with, or maybe mechanical engineering. I would much more prefer an item is written to measure a dimension or a latent variable, right? Because we're doing measurement. This is literally putting the metric in psychometric, right? So metric, measurement, those types of things. Okay. Um, basically, uh, for the first item, I actually went back and recoded it so that it's a non-governmental item. There's actually, it's questionable whether it's government or not. U.S. invasion of Iraq was not part of a campaign to fight terrorism, but was driven by oil companies and yada, yada, yada. I don't even want to say it. It just <laughs> makes me sick just saying it. Anyway, um, this to me was less government and more the non-government actors, the oil companies or the other groups and so forth. So clearly not a, I might have to change the state of the next time. I get depressed looking at it. So I'm just gonna get tired of it. Anyway. Not next time, like the next time I teach it. So, Anyway, I call that a non-government item. It's actually factor two, and of course I didn't change my notation down here. This should be theta two, lambda one two. But basically when we do that, where the one in the Q matrix goes, we see a loading and a latent variable put there. All right. So I had this slide before and I realized my matrix algebra was off because the dimensions didn't work. If you have a Q matrix, though, you can actually see how it works for each item using a little matrix algebra. Specifically, what we're doing with the Q matrix is this Q, this element, right? So in this case, the first element for the first item. Does the first item measure the first factor is what it's trying to say. It's either a zero or a one. If it's zero, it deletes all of that. And if it's a one, it keeps it in the model. 
we could write that out with a, sim uh, a small matrix equation. If we thought of theta as being a row vector, so this is a person's set of factor scores, and we thought of the Q matrix, if we took the Q matrix and moved it into a diagonal matrix. So basically, what is a diagonal matrix? Um, a diagonal matrix is just the elements down the diagonal. Another way of looking at this is taking Q times the identity matrix for two dimensions. Our Q vector was 0 and 1. The identity matrix is 1, 1. The matrix algebra for that leads to a 2 by 2 matrix that's with a 1 where in the diagonal where it needs to go. Finally, if we multiply that by the possible loadings, the lambda 1 is a vector of what could be on the item. Here's what ends up happening, right? So let me show you what happens. Uh, lambda, uh, both of the thetas multiply this diagonal matrix right here. Uh, what that ends up giving us, actually, let me go the other way around. This diagonal matrix multiplies the lambdas right here. And that actually leads to a vector that looks like this, a zero where the very first lambda would have been. Because the matrix algebra, that first zero, actually the way you do matrix multiplication, you take the first element of the first row and multiply it by this element here. So that's zero times that factor loading. The second, and then you add it to the, as you go forward, right? So, so the very first one has two zeros in the first row. Some of those together, you get zero. You have a zero and one for the second row down here on the bottom. Can't even highlight it. And that's where you get lambda one, two. And when you multiply the person's thetas by the factor loadings that are left, you just end up with the right dimension on the item. I'm mentioning that because, so I do a lot of multidimensional models and honestly coding them can take a long time because without incorporating a Q matrix into the process that you do, you may have to spell out each item's set of loadings separately for each line of code. Now we have a 10 item example, that's 10 lines of code but you can imagine the, 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 the difficulty that that brings, right? Not only if you're like me, you'll start with one line and you'll copy and paste. And you already saw from my slides my ability to copy and paste and then pay attention to what I pasted. Not good, right? So I'm saying all this because what I'm going to show you is code to automate. If you give it a Q matrix, it'll fit the right model. That's what I'm going to give you, right? Took me a while to build it, but I think I've got it, right? It will not do any latent variable interactions. That's the one drawback, but that's okay. None of the models that we typically teach have them unless you're in the diagnostic model world. But I'll show you that in the next falls class about latent variable interactions and so forth. All right, any questions? Am I going too quickly? This, by the way, is just a precursor. There's some more matrix algebra to come. Anybody, can, anybody say, yeah, question? Yeah, I'll do one. Is there any difference between this thing and, and uh, one AFA model with two factors? What is the AFA model? The uh, item factor analysis. No, um, not any. Are the same thing? Same thing. Okay. Same thing. Item factor analysis is often um, estimated using limited information, whereas um, our li limited information does not use the full data likelihood. It doesn't use each observation. It usually is summary of the statistics. And in the case of item factor analysis, it's usually a polycor correlation matrix. Bayesian model data likelihood is full information. So in many, many senses, what we're going to estimate here is more similar to what we would call multidimensional IRT's estimation method, which is marginal maximum likelihood. But because item factor analysis sort of sprouted off from IRT in the social sciences in the 70s, at the time when estimation wasn't clear how we did it, it came up with limited information methods separate from what we do. And we don't see those a lot in education, but those do prevail in other social sciences and it, as implemented in M plus by default, for instance. Also, if you use Levon to estimate this model, it will use limited information as well. Uh, too much information? Okay. Anybody else think that's too much information? I'm full of too much information. All right. Here is terrible formatting. There's the Q matrix. There's the model it implies. I think I got that right, right? There's all 10 items. You can't see the 10th, but believe me, it's there. Now, 
let's talk about this multivariate normal distribution. When you see that on the screen, what do you, what's your first reaction? First impression, distribution function. Is it a lot? Is it beautiful? It's normal. It's normal. Oh! <laughs> Stat jokes for the win. I like it. Um, yeah, there's a lot to this, right? This, for a given set of um, latent variables, in this case, tells you the height of the density, right? um, conditional upon a vector of latent variable means and a covariance matrix itself. All right, this term right here is the determinant. The determinant of a matrix um, is a heavy, heavy calculable. I'm trying to find an easy way to summarize it. It characterizes. Uh, in this case, remember a covariance matrix. What is the feature of covariance, right? It's symmetric, right? It's square. So a determinant of a square and symmetric matrix will actually characterize whether it can be inverted. It also describes this. This is also the, what's called the generalized variance. If you haven't taken multivari multi multivariate statistics, it's where you sort of see this. Generalized variance talks about how much variance there is across the entire set of dimensions that you have. Why I mention this is the covariance matrix for data, if we observe the data, is likely to be something that we say is non -neg uh, non sorry, positive semi-definite. It's a word you may have heard. That's OK if you haven't. What does that mean? Um, most of the time with data, so long as we don't have a perfect correlation between two variables, it's positive definite, and this determinant is greater than zero. If the determinant is greater than zero, we can take an inver inverse of the matrix. That's what it's talking about, using conventional inverse matrix ways. If the determinant is equal to zero, this inverse is uh, undefined. It becomes very difficult to estimate. So the closer you have two variables, that are have a the way that we see it here is as two variables that are almost perfectly correlated. Uh, you start to see non-invertible matrices. Um, I'm mentioning this because both of these terms, determinant and inverse, take a lot of calculation. Right. So every step of the chain that we're trying to sample them or evaluate a likelihood with them in potentially could have a lot of calculations that we need and. They're a source of numerical instability in estimation. Right? We can, if, we, if we code things like the way we see it on this slide, we don't always get the number. We get a lot of rounding error. Excuse me, so scratch my nose. Right? That rounding error is bad. It could throw off a lot of what we're doing estimation-wise. But there's ways that we can limit it that I'm going to show you that are a little bit more technical. OK? All right. So the nice thing is for us, what we're going to do is set the means, the vector of factor means all to zero for this class. We're using, again, standardized factor identification, meaning the mean of each factor is zero and the variance of each factor is one, which actually turns this covariance matrix into a correlation matrix. The diagonal elements are all one, and for this to make it work in our um, uh, distribution here, the off diagonal elements have to be between negative one and one as well. Any questions on any of this? All right. Which we just talked about that. I uh, did that. Okay. So, what we're doing for items though is we're going to use the greater response model parameterization. Now, technically, you could use anything I've shown you to this part point. You like the binomial? Throw the binomial on there. You like CFA? Throw CFA on there. You like nominal? Uh, that's a little harder. But you can throw that on there too. You need more loadings in that case. But you can do this. So what does that mean for us? We're going to have a set of ordered intercepts effectively. The other thing that uh, the part, this is, we call it graded response or ordinal logit for this model. And this is what happens if you fit the item factor analysis model. It's usually the default in almost every package. Okay. 
Um, the other thing I'll note is Stan does not like the intercepts though. Right? Stan codes them as thresholds, which means uh, each of these intercepts is negative one times the threshold. And the order of the threshold is reversed because every time you multiply an inequality by negative one, you flip the inequality. All right. I feel like I, I'm boring you to tears. But get to the data already. Is that it? All right. Here comes the fun. We're going to build this in Stan. Rub my hands together for heat, right? It's cold outside. Um, what do we have here? Yep, this is the ordered intercepts that you see right here. Let's talk about the model block. The model block, let's start with this right here. The item, Y tilde, tilde ordered logistic, we saw that before, but now I'm using a theta matrix times a lambda matrix. Actually, lambda matrix transpose right there. All right. What that does is it um, allows me to build in the zeros that we have in our Q matrix into the lambda matrix itself. And you'll note this lambda matrix is only specified for a single item. We're looping across each item. So by doing that, this lambda matrix only has the loadings that we're estimating for each item. Does that sound, sound OK? All right. Now, uh, the theta matrix itself is just the, the matrix of all the latent variables, right? So each person has two entries in this matrix for the two-dimensional model, right? Theta 1 and theta 2. Um, I put that into a big uh, n persons by two dimensions matrix because I can do a quick matrix product and have this be what's called vectorized code so it runs a little bit quicker. The lambda matrix, again, is to make the math work. So if this is a, an n by 2 matrix in the theta, or I guess I'm calling it yeah, n, by, n by 2 in this case, and the lambda matrix then needs to be, um, before, uh, after the transpose, 2 by 1 to make it work. So the lambda matrix is uh, 1 by 2 for each item. Right? So we can think of that as it looks like the Q matrix. Remember, the Q matrix is this thing. Everywhere you see a one, we'll put an estimated lambda in it, and that's our lambda matrix, okay? So when you get down to the actual model part, the Q matrix is where you hold the lambdas. The problem with Stan, though, is you can't estimate things that are set to zero. You have to use some weird, weird quick quirks to go and rearrange things to fit into this style. All right, so let's go through that a little bit. Um, more notes here. Um, here, if we look at theta, theta is what I'm defining as my latent variables in Stan. Theta has to be an array to use. Now, it says it follows a, something called multinormal Cholesky. I'll get to Cholesky in just a second. Cholesky is our answer to numerical instability. It's a matrix thing. Anybody heard of Cholesky decompositions before? If you haven't, you're in for, this is gonna be a life altering day. Let's just put it that way. Actually, no. <laughs> Mind numbing, but not in a good way. Maybe that's more appropriate. But long story short, this is a multivariate normal distribution. Um, the problem with Stan, is when you define something as a multivariate normal distribution, it wants it to be an array. And an array can't be used in a matrix product. All right? So saying theta follows multivariate normal, so theta is an array, means I couldn't use theta down here to multiply the lambda matrix. So I have another step in which I load all the thetas into theta matrix. And I'll show that step in a different block in just a moment. It's the transform parameters block that we use. All right. The other thing is I have the mean theta here. That's our vector of means. We import that and we set it to zero by um, our data. And then I have theta core L. That is a part of the correlation matrix of theta. All right. It's the part of it. And I'll just 
hold off for a second. Think for right now it's the correlation matrix, all right? It's easier to think about that. But it's the correlation. Turns out, if you're using STAN, it may not seem like it, because I gotta get through the technical part here, but STAN it makes doing multidimensional models ridiculously easy because the prior that you can put on a correlation matrix is something called the LKJ prior itself, which is built into STAN. The LKJ prior is a fairly recent prior. It's been, um, so I started doing Bayes early 2000s, and bless you, well, we were thinking about um, trying to estimate correlation matrices, and there were no really good options out there. And this is a 2009 invention, but long story short, if you use JAGS, it's not in JAGS. I guess you could try to code it in JAGS, but it may take, may not even be possible, or it may take a very long time to run. Stan uh, uses this. The LKJ are the, the letters of the authors of a paper. I don't remember the, the first two. The last name is uh, Joe. The last one is Joe, who's published in other areas, in psychometrics even, uh, that we use in uh, limited information <coughs> model fit. But that LKJ prior, we'll talk about in just a moment, it makes it easy. We can specify a correlation matrix, which means we can estimate models that are standardized variable as we go forward. In other, in JAGS, we couldn't do that. We had to estimate these with marker items to make it work. So that's the other part of it. And finally, we have our same prior for lambda here that we had before and the same prior for each of the thresholds that we had before. Questions? Yes? So at the end, we will have two, two theta estimates for each person. That's right. Based on the factor that each item loves. That's right. That's right. Actually, while we asked, well, since you asked that question, let me ask not just you, but the rest of the class, including those of you online, how many additional parameters do we have in this model as compared to the unidimensional model that we estimated before in terms of um, non-person parameters? All right, anything but theta. Well, if we go back to this model specification, we can see here each item is going to have the same set of, well, thresholds, right? And because none of the items, in the, and if we go back to the Q matrix, we can see each item uh, only measures one dimension. There's no multidimensional items, right? So that means we have the same number of factor loadings. We specified the factor means, those are not being estimated. We specified the factor variances, those are not being estimated. But there is one additional parameter in the correlation between factor one and factor two. So that's the one parameter that's estimated that's not a person parameter that's additional to this model. If we add in the person parameters, then every person, get, has, you know, we, have, we have 177 people in our data. We'll have 177 new thetas and one correlation between theta one and theta two, right? So in many ways, this model, apart, when you look only at the structural model parameters, is only slightly more complicated. But when you add in person parameters, we doubled the number of latent variables we have. Other questions? Let's talk a little bit more about LKJ priors. LKJ, uh, you can go to the, click on that to see the uh, reference in the functions manual of STAN. But basically, for a correlation matrix, I call this R, of theta. This is our latent variable correlation matrix. Uh, the correlation matrix itself we know is positive definite, I mean, right? Which means the determinant of R has to be greater than zero. Sorry for my typo of not closing a parenthesis here. Uh, we know the correlation matrices are symmetric uh, and the di diagonal values are all one. Turns out um, this LKJ prior is proportional to taking the determinant, raising it to a term eta minus one, where eta is a hyperparameter in the prior itself. Remember hyperparameter? It's like the prior mean, the prior variance, those types of things. Eta is the hyperparameter of the LKJ process to get a prior. I would almost call it distribution, but I don't think it's actually a distribution. It's sort of a process that goes through to provide a prior for it. When you specify eta to be one, however, 
the density is uniform all over correlation matrices. Think about why that is. If the prior is proportional to raising the determinant to eta minus one, when eta is one, it's proportional to a value of one, which is uniform for the prior. If theta were, if, if eta were uh, greater than one, then the identity matrix turns out to be the mode. Remember identity matrix, right? Remember, this is a two by two matrix that we're trying to estimate here, correlations, right? And really all we're estimating is one off diagonal because it's symmetric, right? So if we say the identity matrix is the, is the mode of that prior, what we end up doing is forcing correlations to be more close to zero. The identity is a diagonal of ones and zeros in the off diagonal. So what that ends up doing, if we put a bigger eta here, we suppress the correlations. We sort of bring them down a little bit. Or we put pressure on them from the prior. Again, this is a prior likelihood, not a data likelihood, right? And if we pick a number between zero and one, then it, the density actually has a trough at the identity. It's not, um, not the modal distribution anymore. But I prefer this one. I love uniform priors. You know me. I like uninformed priors. Um, so I'm going to let eta be one, and we just have a uniform prior on our correlation matrix. How are we doing with this? Seat belts fastened. Here it comes. Now, let's talk a little bit about that matrix determinant and matrix inverse. Turns out, both of those are bad, numerically. What do I mean by that? If you go into R, right here, and uh, let's go to here. Um, let's do this. Uh, R equals matrix. Let's just build a two by two matrix. This is our correlation matrix right here. And I'll just put a, anybody want to pick a number between negative one and one for me real quick? Uh, negative eight over three. Negative eight over three? E over three. No. <laughs> okay. One third. <laughs> like that, right there? <laughs> All right. There it is. Uh, whoops, no, that's not what I wanted. Come on, Templin. I mean, it equals here. There, there we go. How's that sound, right? So that's a correlation matrix. Anybody know how to take an inverse of that in R? Or taken an inverse of the matrix before? Solve. So let's talk about a matrix inverse first, right? The inverse of this correlation matrix looks like this. Now, I'm going to give you the, li the linear algebra lecture that I streamlined for when I taught my classes at KU. I remember I told you that deal I made all my students when I was teaching intro. It's like, you just have to remember one formula, and it was like the normal equation, x transpose x inverse x transpose y. I had to teach about the inverse. What is the inverse doing? I'm going to teach you thinking of inverse as division. It's not entirely division. It's not exactly division. There's mathematical parts to it. But from a point of view, if you're not used to matrix inverses, think of it this way. If we think of, um, if I wanted to show you, here, this, right here. If I take the matrix inverse and I multiply it by the original matrix, I should get back the identity matrix. Another way of thinking that, let's take the number five, right? If we were to pretend that one over five is the inverse of five, which again, I don't know if we would call that the inverse of five, but that's, that's that. If we multiply this, we get the identity back from a scalar, right? A matrix inverse is such that if you pre-multiply the original matrix by its inverse, you get very close to the identity, diagonal, close to one, off diagonal, oh, we're starting to see a little bit of rounding error, right? It's not exactly zero, but very close. Right? The other property of it is if we remember matrices, you have the order matters of multiplication. If we do uh, post multiply by it, we also get the inverse of the identity, right? So 
A matrix inverse is a matrix that when you multiply its non-invertible, its non-inverted form returns the identity. Right? Fair? Okay. Okay. Uh, we also can figure out the determinant of a matrix in R that way. Right? The determinant of this matrix turns out the determinant of any matrix for two by two is the product of the diagonal, is it minus? Yes, I think it's, no. Yes, minus the product of the off diagonal, right? It's A, B, 10, minus C, D, right? Those of you who've done matrix algebra recently, I did it, I use it, I'm more worried about it numerically. Does that make sense? If you think of the matrix, <laughs> never mind. All right. All right, determinant again to characterize it. So what am I saying with this? This determinant is positive, which means we could actually take the inverse of R. Right, that is our matrix inverse right there, okay? If we had chosen a different value of R, what if I say, I'll call this not R equals, and let's do not R off diagonal elements Now, look at that. That's clearly not a correlation matrix, right? Let's take the determinant of that. The determinant is negative three. This is what we would call um, a non-invertible matrix. And the way that we talk about if a matrix doesn't have an inverse, we call it a singular matrix. It's, it's not invertible. Not with this standard matrix term, the, the definition of a matrix inverse being the matrix that when multiplied by the original form returns the identity. Right? There's another definition of matrices called a generalized inverse that we don't need to get into, but we can still invert with that. There's actually quite a few different generalized inverses, but it's not what we need here. But now if I try to take solve of not R, first of all, I need to type it. Goodness gracious. Oh, it still worked. Huh, that's, impre that's impressive. So yeah, don't, moral of the story is don't pretend that you know what you're doing with this. All right. Huh, story short. That's matrix inverses. I don't know why that worked. Maybe it's doing a generalized inverse and I don't realize that. But in a general sense, we can't let it be non-invertible. So why I'm saying this. Number one, you can think about Correlation, in a two by two correlation matrix, correlation isn't that difficult. All the values of negative one to one are, are allowed and the matrix will have a positive determinant so long as that off diagonal is not equal to one. When you have three, now you, when you have a three variable solution, now it's harder because not only the correlations have to go between negative one and one, the additional constraint is that the, in the, in, in the, the matrix itself still must have a positive determinant, which means there are some ranges of correlations that won't be allowed, right? If you have three dimensions and you have two correlations that are 0.9 each and you do a negative 0.9, that's going to actually be a determinant that's not allowed, right? So the correlations become yoked together when you want them to be positive definite as a matrix. This is a terrible math problem. This is solved by LKJ. So that's just one of the nice things about it. But now let's talk about Cholesky decompositions. Let's go back to our original matrix. Turns out matrices are just boxes of numbers. You knew this already. You can actually take a matrix and do stuff to it and keep all the numbers meaning the same. Uh, but by just by changing where those boxes, those numbers actually exist. And one of those ways of doing that, what am I talking about? The Cholesky decomposition is a way that we can take our matrix and convert it into something that looks a little different, right? It creates a triangular matrix, L, such that that triangular matrix times the transpose of it brings back the correlations. Now, why do we want triangle? I'll show you in just a moment. There's some matrix operations that limit the math we need. We'll get to that in just a bit. But the triangular form, we can do an R as well. Sorry. There. 
This is actually the upper triangle. Uh, oh, we'll just do that. So I've defined the lower triangle before. So this is, this is our lower triangle right there. This matrix right here, if I, say, if I call that L, and then if I want to show you what happens, if I take L times the transpose of L, we get back our original R matrix. Right? So what the Cholesky decomposition is doing is taking a square symmetric matrix, technically square symmetric, and I believe positive definite for Cholesky, and taking the numbers and converting it into what's called a triangular matrix. A triangular matrix only has numbers that are on one side, the diagonal and below, or the diagonal and above. Right? This is a lower triangular matrix, is what we call here. There's a zero in the upper triangle portion. Okay. Why we do that is because to take a matrix inverse or to take a determinant, it's a lot easier numerically on the computer to work with a diagonal matrix than it is to work with the entire matrix itself. What do I mean by that? <laughs> uh, the determinant of R is actually equal to the, if we replace R with this lower plus upper triangle matrix. These two determinants are the same, right? I could show you an R here. There, the determinants are the same for either, right? So we need that determinant to calculate our likelihood. Turns out that is the determinant of one times the determinant of the other, but it, because this is the same number, the determinant is actually found by the product of the diagonal elements, right? So what do I mean by that? Here in R, if I take diag of L, if I take the product of that, and I square the product of that, I get the determinant back right there. So what do I mean by that? What is, think about what I just did. I took two numbers, multiplied them together, and then squared that result, right? So it's like three numeric operations. Had I done this without using a Cholesky for just this two by two, I would have had to take two numbers, multiply them, subtract two numbers that are multiplied as well, which is another additional step, and actually it gets even worse. With two by two, it's about the same, but with a bigger matrix, it gets even worse. There's a lot of more math that goes involved with that. Why that's important is every time you multiply numbers together in a computer, remember numerical precision becomes an issue. Not all the decimals get represented, right? And so the more and more that you do matrix calculation or number, numeric calculation, you lose accuracy of the result. So, this Cholesky decomposition allows us to limit the amount of calculations involved in the determinant. It also allows us to, I'm sorry, not limit, reduce. We also are able to reduce the amount of calculations in the inverse. And I'll show that real quick. But in this right here, this is the, the multivariate normal distribution if you just look at the term in the exponent. Right, where the inverse happens. I substituted sigma sub theta for r sub theta just to keep this consistent. Again, I can resubstitute L times L transpose raised to an inverse. One of the properties of inverse matrices is then we can actually distribute the inverse but have to reorganize the product in those. And now it turns out this side and this side are roughly like proportional to each other. They're, they're basically identical. But moreover, bless you, because we have an inverse of a triangular matrix here, the way that we can solve this is a method called back substitution or forward substitution depending on which side. But in, in matrix algebra, one of the very first things they teach you about inverting matrices is sort of, or better yet, solving systems of equations it's trying to reorganize what you do so that the last term can be 
uh, used once and then you sort of backward substitute it as you go to each equation moving forward. This is my quick matrix algebra summary. But what do I mean, what does that mean for us? It's a whole lot less calculation when we have larger matrices. Two by two, there's not a lot of change, but larger matrices will see that. And a whole lot less calculation means we can get away with not having to do a whole lot. Okay, so believe it or not, if you took linear models and you learned X transpose X inverse, X transpose Y. How many of you did that in your linear model? Most of you did somewhere? It's in bold and blaze in your head. That's not how R calculates it, not how our software calculates it, the linear equations, because you have X transpose X inverse in it. What ends up happening is we use a different type of decomposition of X transpose X. X transpose X is also a square and symmetric matrix. Diagonal is not one, but it's square and symmetric. We use a, uh, a decomposition called QR. Um, QR, I believe, was created by Alan Turing. Turing. If you remember um, history of artificial intelligence, or uh, he was a, a British military officer, uh, crack, helped crack the Enigma code in World War II, the German, um, uh, what is it, encryption itself. So heavy, heavy contributions in all sorts of fields. And QR was a different type of um, uh, decomposition. This decomposition is a little bit more um, robust, stable to the types of data you see in, in linear regression. And it actually works out to be roughly the same as Cholesky, I believe, in a correlation matrix sense. So long story short, every time you've learned about something inverse in the matrix world, when it goes to the computer side, there's usually a decomposition going on behind the scenes to make that work because of the numerical stability issues. I don't know if you've heard that before. But if you look at... Um, Again, I probably shouldn't do this. Uh, I'm trying to show you the LM fit in R. There it is. Method equals QR. So if you fit a linear model in R, it's actually using this decomposition of X transpose X. And it, where is it listed? Well, I can't find it now. That, that's all right. Anyway, long story short, you can trace the breadcrumbs down and see how it builds linear models, all right? I didn't know this. I wish I would have learned this in school because it's such a big difference from what you learn in linear algebra class if you don't use the computing part of it. The computing part of linear algebra is very different than the theory part of linear algebra, if that makes any sense to you. Have I lost you all now? Have I bored you? Is this too much information? This is too much information, all right? Thank you. Mubarak, you get an A today. <laughs> Just kidding. At least one. At least one. Um, but my guess is you already knew QR. And things. No, you didn't. Okay, even better. Um, anyway. All right, so that's why we use in Stan, why we see Cholesky here and multinormal Cholesky is Stan just lets you put in the lower triangle of the matrix into each of these functions. So what that means is we can, uh, it doesn't have to do additional calculation to get it to correlation and then remove it from correlation. It just works with Cholesky in every part. So its likelihood function for multinormal normal Cholesky will use something that looks like this in the exponent. Right? It just uses this L term. In fact, Theta core L, the reason why L is there is that is not the correlation matrix. It's the lower triangle of the Cholesky decomposition of the correlation matrix. Now, if you read the Stan manual, and believe me, I have, I think I'm about to get blocked from going to Stan's website <laughs> for how much I've been there. <clears throat> it will talk about the, um, the LKJ correlation distribution. But it has a note, it says, however, it is much better computationally to work directly with the Cholesky factor of sigma. So this distribution should never be explicitly used in practice. So it's there to teach you sort of what's happening behind the scenes, but it's like, yeah, don't ever use 
the, tr the correlation matrix. Use the Cholesky Evit. Okay. And so much so that at least Stan backs up its its work here by when we get to the parameters itself. When we define theta core L as a set of parameters, there's an actual, remember how we have to tell each type of parameter to Stan? Integer, real, whatever. Well, there's a type of parameter called Cholesky factor core. You tell it how many dimensions it has, in our case, two dimensions for two factors. And it defines this to be able to be used in multinormal Cholesky and LKJ core Cholesky as well. So we define it as a lower triangular matrix. The prior works just on the lower triangle. The likelihood works just on the lower triangle. Now we don't want to output the lower triangle, so I'm gonna, we're gonna put it back into the regular matrix in the generated quantities block. But that's where we define it. Any questions? So that's the one catch about multi-dimensional multi models. Actually, there's a couple of catches. I was telling Lisa, all right, so what are we, she's like, what are you teaching in class? I'm like, well, multidimensional. She's like, oh, that's straightforward. I'm like, with a general Q matrix and a Cholesky. <laughs> she told me this was not going well. Uh, so she's, I don't know. I think it's going great, personally. I love this stuff, but that's me. So the Cholesky, you use that if it's, you just have a really, really big matrix and you, it's just Use that whenever you take any inverse matrix. Okay. That's computationally the way to work. Okay. If you look at Jonathan Templin's prior work, I didn't know about this until I was already producing code doing inverses, and so I was doing inverses the wrong way, or the hard way, and some of my algorithms that I had started with may have been more unstable than they needed to be. But Cholesky keeps things a little bit more stable. The other thing I will note is the lambda itself. So remember in the code, Lambda is put into lambda matrix in the model, right? This is lambda matrix, but lambda is specified separately. So again, I have to use another step of stand to go and fill in the zeros. So I define lambda by the number of loadings I'm estimating. Remember in the previous models, this was the number of items, when we only have one dimension for a factor or a latent variable, each item has a loading, so there's only n items loadings, right? Here for the Q matrix, you can have more than one loading on an item. We didn't, but we could. So I have to specify this as the number of loadings. And I have to calculate that from the Q matrix. So now I'm linking another block of stand together. <laughs> that look. Is this the degree of difficulty look? Trust me, well, it'll... This is, this, I think this is my final project. This is. Which I'm stressed about. But no, here's the funny thing. Like, if you take my code, even if you don't know how it works, and you give it a Q matrix, it runs. I'm just trying to give you, like, to get there. <laughs> All right? All right. So I'm going to teach you a new stand block. There's six blocks of Stan. I think we're using all six in this model. I haven't talked about the transform data block, I don't believe. The transform data block does calculations or transformations of your data before the chains run. So it only happens once. And then from there, the variables you've defined in there, you can use in the model statement, okay? So where would we use transform data, right? Well, if you wanted to do some transformation of your data, but not on the data side in R, you wanted to just do that in STAN, that's one way. We're gonna use this to our advantage. We're gonna use this to process the Q matrix. So in transform data is where I define the number of loadings, right? It's an integer. I set it equal to zero to start because I have to initialize things using uh, C++ or Fortran, you have to give it a starting value. And then I literally go through, e for each dimension or each factor in the Q matrix, I take the sum of the column of that matrix, right? Remember the Q matrix? I do this. There's our Q matrix. What it's doing is taking the sum of the first column and then taking, adding it to the sum of the second column. So this is just adding the number of loadings. Okay, 
So then I need to create a variable, a matrix I'm calling, or an array I'm calling loading location, where the Q matrix has rows by columns. And what I need to save is which row position and which column position a given loading is in. So when I build my loading matrix, I can just go and fill in the data in each of those spots. Okay? So I loop through each of the items and each of the factors. You know, I don't really like loops, but this only runs once, so it runs pretty quickly. Right? It runs at the beginning of the chain. And I'm saying if the Q matrix is a one for a given item and factor, I take which item it is, I take which factor it was from, and then I update the, the loading number that it went with. Right? So each loading, so lambda here has number of loadings. We have 10 loadings in this example. Lambda has 10 spots. The loading location tells me the row and column of the Q matrix each of those 10 came from. Right? So if I go over here, this first loading is in row one, column two. So its loading location will be one, two. And I'm gonna use that in my next step. Cool? It's a lot, right? So going into the parameters block, actually, pardon me, the next block, I think I showed you this in the nominal response model the day before, or the, day, the last day of class before break. So honestly, I forgot what I taught you. I actually had to go to my YouTube video just to make sure. That's how much I had wiped the slate clean from back then. But transform parameters runs every step of the chain. So if you're making a transformation of your parameters, this is where you do this. For us, we're gonna use it to build the lambda matrix so that the lambda matrix has the right zeros in it. So it looks like the Q matrix, with the exception of where the ones are, we put our estimated loadings. Cool? Maybe? I don't know. Can you do just a little bit of like graphical, like these matrix, how they go together? Yeah, let's try that. All right. Here's the thing, we have this Q matrix. Yep. What we want it to be, um, and actually we have theta back. I'm just gonna make a vector of thetas for people, okay? This, yeah, that's this right. Way or this way? Yeah, let's make it a matrix, let's do that. Well, a row of it is a vector, the whole box is a matrix. So right. let me show you the whole box. Oh, but it's two because it's, it's a matrix. Okay. Yeah, it is horizontal, right? Let me do, the, let me, sh yeah, it, well, okay. let me just, build it real quick. Great, thank you. Yep. Uh, we have 177 people, so I'm just going to anchor in 177 for each, okay? Great. I'm filling this with just random normal values, but here's theta matrix. Right there. 177 by 2 is the size of it. Right, 177 by two. We need to multiply this by, to make, remember for each item, we have 177 people that are gonna be a likelihood to evaluate it. But each one of those has to be a one by one element, right? So I need to make, multiply this by a two by one to make that happen. So if I go back to the Q matrix, And let's imagine we want to build the likelihood for the first item, right? The Q matrix will select which factor needs to go there. But instead of that, let's call this the lambda matrix. So I'm going to start by building a Q matrix here. So here's our lambda matrix. I'm actually going to be saying those aren't lambdas. Those are just zeros and ones. But let's... Let's just make some random loadings. Let's start all loadings at 0.7, just for instance, right? So, so now these are the loadings. So for item one, if I just take the very first row of it, I have a one by two vector where the second value is the loading of the second dimension. 
right? So now, this is 1 by 2. And we saw before, my theta matrix was 177 by 2. So what I actually have to do is I have to multiply the theta matrix, matrix multiply, by the transpose of lambda matrix 1. The transpose of this, remember, is a, is a 2 by 1. Oh, you know what? That's because... R doesn't like what I'm doing here. What did I do wrong? All right, I'm trying, sorry. Yeah, that's why. Okay, so when I do this in R with the matrix, it doesn't like, it, it's no longer a matrix. When I just take one of the rows, it's now a numeric, and I have to put it back into a matrix. Don't get me started on R. No, I'm just kidding. There, that's what I want to do. So I need to multiply. That's the transpose of it, right? So now I take theta matrix, and I matrix multiply that. And that gives me, for each person, the product of that loading times the second theta. Okay? Sort of? Yeah. Well, I understand conceptually what's happening in terms of like all the multiplications, but because of the way matrix algebra just works in terms of like the transpose, like I understand all of these things and seeing it all together in terms of like the thetas mm -hmm. are this way, the lambdas are this way, like whatever would help. Yeah. So we don't, don't worry about it. Well, right this, is what, this is it though. This is it. Right, but seeing it out in matrix form, not like bold vector notation, does that make sense? Like the, the numbers are here. Right, but in a string of all of the things. Uh, so like, they, like, we've got the theta, we've got the lambda vector, we've got the Q vector, we've got... Like right over here? No. Where did I put it? I mean, this thing. Right here? Yes, but I want to see it in like the boxes sort of a thing. Not that. So I can you mean that from down this. down here. These boxes. Yes, thank you. Okay. So I'm trying to trying to put it yes. there. The problem is with the boxes, it's you know, I, I run out of Wait, as soon as you get more than two things, it's massive. I get that. Yeah, really. so but I'm trying to I wanna I'm trying to work with you here. Thank so you. did I miss something that did I Okay, no, no, but I just want to make sure that that's, no, it's okay, I, I understand it. It's a lot to hold on to in memory. Did I get what you were trying to go, I tried to show here with it. So basically what I'm trying to say is, with each of these 177 uh, loading times factor results here, that gets added to the threshold for each submodel and then the, the likelihood gets evaluated, right? So for all 177, that's where that goes. But now, um, let me keep going here. The transform parameters builds that loading matrix. Remember, we had the Q matrix before. And we have to turn the ones into the loading estimates. And so what it does is it starts off with a matrix of zeros. So everything's zero. And it loops through every loading. And it fills in for each loading the row position and the column position with that loading's estimated value. So it's just building that lambda matrix that we had where I did the Q matrix times whatever before. So we're building that matrix. The other thing we're building here, because you cannot matrix multiply an array and stand, we're taking the theta matrix and we're building it. So a theta matrix is literally the same quantities that theta's array is. It's just a different type of variable in Stan's architecture. This is a computer science issue, right? You have to convert type, type conversion sometimes it's called. So theta matrix is just the, the box of data, 177 by two. And basically we're taking each column of the array of thetas 
and converting it to a vector that then fits into that matrix. It's literally just copying data over. But because theta matrix is a type of matrix, it can then do a matrix product. Whereas theta itself is an array which cannot do a matrix product. So that's why we had to build it that way in Stan. It's a lot, isn't it? Sorry. I tried it. I, well, the end of it is copy my code, all right? <laughs> At least to get you started. Um, here's the data block. Um, I changed two, you have to add, you add two new things, uh, actually three new things. Uh, the mean of the factors, which is mean theta, the number of factors, and the Q matrix. So you just supply the Q matrix that you had before, and it runs. And then I have generated quantities. Why do I have generated quantities? Before I had it so I could calculate intercepts instead of thresholds. The, here, I'm going to define a correlation matrix, which is another type of variable or data in R, called theta core. And theta core is where I'm going to take the, the lower triangular Cholesky and multiply it by itself transpose. So I'm going to save the correlation matrix, not the Cholesky. Stan's calculation is running on uh, Cholesky. Cholesky I don't think in, so I make it back into correlation and we output correlation. A lot? There are six type blocks in Stan. I think we used all six for this analysis. That's awesome, right? Anyway. Let me just quickly show the results here. Um, I input this. Note again, I'm, I'm using a smaller chain. It actually takes a lot longer to run this. That correlation causes a whole lot of difficulty. Um, I still start my factor loadings as being positive and random. And here are the results. By the way, convergence, a little bit less converge with the smaller chains, 1.08. But let's scroll down. These values right here are the correlations of theta. Those are the ones that had a hard time converging. And the estimated correlation between the two dimensions was 0.993. When you see a correlation between latent variables of 0.993, what do you think? They're the same. So two dimensions is questionable in this analysis. Actually. Not any more, much more than questionable. It's much likely not true. We have to get to model fit to really tell. This is the correlation chain. It's bumping up against that upper limit. Although that looks kind of like, I could put that as art, like abstract art in a hallway, like a gift of Jonathan Templin, right? It's better than like, like where my old office, where the students' offices, where my students, where like 224B, there's like an eyeball down there. I'm like, every time I walk by there, it's like the eyes of Lindquist are on me. Anyway, out of time. Um, here's the posterior distribution of the correlation as well. And I just wanted to show you for one person, this is the person one's posterior distributions of theta. They're highly correlated, that's actually 0.86. They're not the same correlation as the 0.998. Each person's posterior distribution will have a slightly different correlation, right? Because remember, each person is a, their own entity. The other thing I was gonna show you was, this is a, a plot of the first theta and the second theta's EAP. Boom, they're the same, pretty much. So that's it. Okay, I'm out of time. You made it though. <laughs> this is the result for lambda and mu is uh, logic, right? These are all logic still, yes. Yep. Thank you for your attention today. I'll be back Friday with less difficult things to talk about, uh, I think. Thank you to all of you online. If your head is blown, I have office hours right after this. And if you were meeting with me after office hours, you can come to office hours, see whatever, whatever you want to do. All right. So see you next time. Thank you all.